Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar brought to you by the YNS Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair of Israel Studies at UCLA. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I'd just like to say a few words about the terrible events that have taken place in Israel and the Gaza Strip over the past 12 days. This has been a deeply painful and worrying time for all those who care about the safety of Israel and the Israeli people, and all those who care about the safety of the Palestinian people, and all of those who yearn for Israeli-Palestinian peace. The death toll from Hamas's terrorist attack has now exceeded 1,400 Israelis, with 3,500 wounded. Around 200 people, mostly civilians, are being held as hostages in the Gaza Strip. And 12 days into the war between Israel and Hamas, around 3,000 Palestinians in the Gaza Strip have been killed and more than 12,500 wounded. In addition, over 1 million people out of Gaza's population of 2.3 million are now displaced. Make no mistake about it. We are living through very dark days perhaps the worst period in the long history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict since at least the Second Intifada, if not since the 1948 war. Israelis and Palestinians alike are suffering and scared. What they've been going through touches on their deepest fears and traumas. In the face of all this heartbreaking tragedy and unrelenting violence, we should have compassion and empathy for all the victims of this conflict. Civilians, whether Israeli or Palestinian, are not legitimate targets for violence. No matter our politics, we should all mourn their deaths. On behalf of everyone at the Nazarian Center, I'd just like to express our deepest condolences to everyone who has been affected, who has lost family and friends in recent days, and that includes our own colleagues in the Israel Studies academic community. During this dark time, we believe that education is all the more important, and we will do all that we can to provide it in the days and weeks ahead. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Professor Daniel Bartal. He's a professor emeritus in the School of Education at Tel Aviv University. His research interest is in, the political, is in political and social psychology, studying the social psychological foundations of intractable conflicts and peace building as well as developing political understandings among children and peace education. In recent years, his writing has also focused on authoritarianism. He's published over 25 books and over 250 articles and book chapters, so I'm not going to uh, read out all the names of his many books. He is a very distinguished academic. He has served as the president of the International Society of Political Psychology and has received uh, numerous awards for his academic achievements. Today, he will be talking to us about his new book, Sinking into the Honey Trap, the case of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which describes how Israeli society learned to ignore the reality in which it exists. The book explains the mechanisms that allow Israelis to ignore this reality and to live in a situation that prolongs the conflict with the Palestinians and postpones the solution to an unseen future. Israeli society is paying a heavy price for the continuation of the conflict as has been tragically evident over the past 12 days. So I'm very grateful that we can hear today from Professor Daniel Bartal, who will talk to us about his book. And after his presentation, I will ask him questions about the events that have taken place and the impact it's having on Israelis. And I also welcome you to send us your questions using the Q&A box. And I will uh, uh, try to pose as many of those questions to Professor Bartal as we have time for. So thank you. And I'm very grateful to welcome Professor Daniel Baltal. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I am uh, very, very pleased with your introduction because I was afraid that it will be in some way, I could, could spell it one-sided uh, in a way that uh, the events demand to some extent to be one-sided with the uh, atrocities that you describe, but you open it very nicely. And this is a story. We have at the moment two narratives, 
uh, or more, in fact. I, I think that we have four narratives, really, uh, at the moment. And we have the Israeli narrative, which is obviously propagated by the government and by the military Israeli and uh, trying to convince the whole world in uh, the justice uh, of what was done and describing the terrible, terrible crime, uh, the atrocities of uh, that Israel suffer in the surprising uh, uh, attack on uh, October 7 in Saturday, unprepared, absolutely unprepared, which allowed the Hamas to carry the atrocities. And almost everyone in Israel is telling a story, a father about the daughter and the son about the father. And it is going on terrible in the way that the description reminds the Israelis really not less than the Holocaust that took uh, part in uh, 39, 45 a century ago. And uh, people compare to this uh, event, the, the tragic great event, obviously Holocaust, where six million Jews perished uh, this small event, which is relatively small, but happened within two days. So in two days is really very large one for the Israeli population where you count that it touched really in about uh, 4 million, because when we talk about two million, 9 million, that we are Israelis, then you take off uh, the Arabs, the ultra-Orthodox who do not serve in the army and do not live around Gaza Strip. So you talk about 4 million, 3 million people, and this is a particular sector, especially when you talk about kibbutzim, mostly uh, who were hurt, and uh, obviously is the road, which is uh, not uh, really a settlement of periphery, as we call it. So it's understandable. But the story is much more complex. So we hear the uh, Israeli government, which try to focus only and only on the event. And we hear the Palestinians who watch what is going on in Gaza Strip with the tremendous losses that are going on. Uh, Gaza is as we want it, uh, and many Israelis support it, is flattened, especially in northern part. And uh, we have the same tragedy where uh, babies are killed, women are killed, uh, old people are killed, civilians are killed. Uh, with the bombers, and it's a very different, obviously, story where pilots don't see the victims versus as what's happened with Hamas, so there is face-to-face, was face-to-face encounter, very cruel one, inhuman one, and uh, this is a difference. So the pilots don't see the victims. And then you have in Israel, also a division, a small minority is thinking that what is going on in Gaza is terrible, it should not happen, but uh, as a demand of the uh, majority of Israelis is to carry the uh, entrance to uh, Gaza Strip, uh, and nobody asks what will be later, what will be the result? How does it, what does it mean to uh, erase uh, Hamas? Who will come instead? How long Israel will have uh, to rule uh, Gaza in order to change the, uh, the regime? It's not because we have to understand 
it's not only a regime, it's an ideology which is religious, ideology, and it is related to the uh, solution of the conflict. And we have to understand that it happened uh, within a particular context. So a lot of uh, people, I think, a minority, but a lot of people still are demanding the first, uh, we will take care of the hostages, where about 200 people, uh, children and women and uh, civilians with soldiers were kidnapped by Hamas. What will happen to them? Uh, in fact, uh, Hamas announced that will kill them, that will, uh, in already some of them so called died. We, know, we are not sure if this is propaganda. We do not differentiate fake news, misinformation, and real information because it's all very obscure and nobody knows. And we, uh, uh, as a, a watcher of television, I don't trust, I must say, what is said in the Israeli television, except the description of the uh, terrible uh, day, two days, three days, uh, but we don't know. And there is obviously people in the world who care about Palestinians, as here the introduction said, so those are innocent people. And in Israel, uh, uh, in Israel uh, it's a real mix up uh, between Hamas and between population of Palestinians uh, 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 and Palestinians. So it's unclear what to believe, what to take, for granted, but what is needed is to look at the large picture, what was going on. And the picture is as following, I will tell you. This was the policy of Netanyahu. Netanyahu uh, really tried uh, a very known uh, uh, policy which was practiced by Romans already many, many years ago, divide and rule. So we have on the one hand, a Palestinian authority and we have Hamas. Palestinian authority is headed by a president named Abu Mazen, who uh, uh, rejected uh, or rejects at the moment to violence, use of violence, and he wants to negotiate two-state solution, but Israel refuses to negotiate with him. And he, and, uh, <clears throat> and he Netanyahu, uh, had a conception that by uh, allowing a stream of money, about a million dollar was given to Hamas, where part of it went, obviously, for the arm and part of it, we don't know how it was divided, was uh, uh, given maybe to the population. So he was a supporter of Hamas uh, uh, in some way uh, in, in order to divide and rule between uh, Palestinian Authority and between Hamas. Uh, and second, which is very important, so you have to understand that whereas uh, uh, Abu Mazen uh, uh, is perceived by Palestinians, almost all the Palestinians, as traitor, which means collaborator with the Israeli military system uh, in a way that it allows uh, to Israeli military soldiers and uh, Shabak's uh, security uh, agency to enter even area A. So I have to pause. You have to know that West Bank is divided to three regions, region A, region B, and region C. Uh, region A is about 20% of Gada, very separated 
a region uh, which e e e really mostly is in the cities of, uh, of uh, West Bank, where the uh, Palestinian Authority has uh, authority with regard to security and with regard to civil matters. So he allows to Israeli uh, soldiers to enter to region uh, A in order to arrest what we call terrorists. And there are some violent encounters in the area. Area B is about uh, 20, 19%. And area C, which is the largest, then Israel has the uh, uh, <coughs> security matters and civil matters. Uh, uh, obviously in their authority, in Israeli authority. There are in area C uh, uh, about 60% uh, of the area and uh, they're lived in about 300,000, 400,000 uh, uh, Palestinians in addition to 475,000 Israeli Jewish settlers. So this is a place of continuous uh, confrontation where Israel is uh, ruling most of the area, really uh, trying, is carrying what we call gripping annexation, pushing uh, from the area, uh, mostly Palestinians, uh, Palestinian shepherds, and uh, obviously farmers and uh, trying to get uh, obviously the uh, uh, ruling over uh, as much as possible of the area C, including obviously uh, area B. So this is a situation in which the uh, Hamas offered an alternative. Alternative is that instead of negotiation, which doesn't go nowhere, there is no negotiation. We know the last attempt was uh, carried by Kerry, John Kerry, when he was a, a, a foreign minister, as we call it, a, of a, in Obama, a, 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 in Obama regime, Obama a, institution and uh, uh, didn't achieve anything because the, uh, Nat Netanyahu did not, want, uh, did not want to share the land, believing in what is called greater Israel, uh, which means that he believes that the uh, West Bank uh, should be part of Israel state, Israeli state, Jewish state, and uh, he is expanding uh, Jewish uh, settlements over. So Hamas offering violent resistance in some way you have to understand is offering Palestinian an alternative to uh, uh, the way that Abu Mazen is going on. And it is uh, accepted by many Palestinians. The polls show so today, if there would be uh, uh, elections, probably Hamas will get a majority over Patah or and PLO. Uh, I am not talking so the way that it was carried the violence is acceptable. And uh, Palestinians, uh, some Palestinians are also shocked very much as a way that the violence were perpetu was perpetuated on Israelis. They did not intend <coughs> that it will be carried the way that it was carried. But in some way, when we talk about concept, it was only force. Israeli says that force can be meet, met uh, by force. And uh, obviously Hamas accepted force should be met by force and they carried it in such unfortunate way. So this is some context 
to what is going on. In addition, that you have to understand, the last government that ruled uh, Israel uh, and is ruling today even, came to power in November uh, 2022. It was the most extremist government that we had since the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, those were na nationalists, uh, racist, and uh, with some of the people uh, of the party that uh, were responsible for the violence that was going on, especially uh, Bitzalel Smotrich and Itamar Ben Gvir. Each of them got a responsibility over at West Bank, and they were pushing very much the, uh, to extend the settlement as well as carrying small pogroms in some of the villages that were involved in uh, terror attacks on Israelis uh, in West Bank. Uh, so this is a situation that we uh, encounter on Saturday the Israeli government was absolutely unprepared, did not get a warning that something is going to happen. And uh, most of the uh, battalions were in the West Bank uh, to deal with the situation there where there was violence. And you have to know that about 200 Palestinians were killed in the West Bank through the year, which is a very large number. Uh, and none uh, of them or very few remained in the Gaza Strip on the assumption that Netanyahu had that with the money he buys also some kind of ceasefire uh, or a peaceful period uh, and did not take care of the warnings that should be when Hamas was preparing the attack. And we believe that such a preparation uh, took probably several months or maybe a year. So uh, it is a failure of the Israeli intelligence uh, and uh, civilians suffered enormous uh, blow uh, in this situation. So maybe, you know, with this uh, uh, introduction of, right, 20 minutes, uh, I would just say that my book, uh, The Sinking, Sinking into the Honey Trap, describes the process from 48 to today, absolutely till today, what happened with the evolvement of, as I call it, culture of conflict, the narrative, the ethos of conflict, and how the uh, uh, sector, which is called Zionist uh, religious, who serve in the army, <coughs> in comparison to ultra-Orthodox, who do not uh, serve in the army, slowly, slowly penetrated into the government, into the army, into the mass media, into civil society, into education system, and took really over uh, with the help of all the governments, in even labor government uh, uh, between uh, 1967 and 1977, when it was in power, it supported the uh, Jewish settlement in the West Bank. And then from 1977, we have mostly Likud in power, except in the short period of uh, uh, Itzhak Rabin, uh, the labor leader, the leader of the peace camp, who tried, tried uh, very hard uh, to bring peace to the region between 1993 and 1995, when he was murdered by a Jew. Uh, and this was the end of the peace process. 
that was accelerated uh, in 2000 when Second Intifada erupted, Second Intifada, where uh, a lot of uh, Jews were killed in suicidal uh, attacks. Uh, and only in 2005, uh, Sharon did the disengage, carried the disengagement from Gaza Strip. And uh, during the Olmer time were a very serious negotiation. But as you know, probably some of you know, he was uh, accused of uh, corruption and his, uh, his trial started and he went to prison, served in prison. And the same is going on with Netanyahu who was accused of breaching the uh, uh, trust and uh, really uh, bribery and he's in uh, trial, on trial, but he did not, uh, did not resign from his office as uh, Olmer did and stays there and uh, has a very large failure where many Israelis call that he will resign at the moment and should not lead the nation that is such a trauma to the next war that we foresee in the near future. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those uh, remarks. I want to first of all uh, remind our audience members that they're welcome to send in uh, their questions. We have uh, uh, plenty of time for questions, so please send us those questions and I will uh, try to uh, select them and pose them to uh, Professor Bartal. Um, I, I want us to talk about the, particularly about the impact of Hamas's terrorist attack on Israeli society. But I think before we, we talk about that, uh, it might be helpful, first of all, uh, to, uh, if you could kind of summarize uh, to our audience um, what you mean by the uh, ethos of conflict of Israeli society. You talk about the kind of collective narrative uh, that Israeli Jewish society developed over the course of this long conflict and this ethos um, which um, underpins the kind of collective psychology of the conflict. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Maybe describe that, uh, that narrative, that ethos a little bit. What are the different elements of it? Yes, of course, you, you know, I, I suggest, uh, suggested and it was well accepted uh, in the academic uh, world uh, because it's really very universal. So it's not really particular to the conflict, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but cannot also explain what is going on in Turkey with uh, in the conflict in Kurds and in uh, Kashmir and uh, in Chechnya and in Rwanda. So in principle, I say that uh, people need to understand uh, what is going on. You know, the uh, context of conflict brings a lot of uncertainty, stress, uh, bereavement, and, and it's a very tough uh, context that people live uh, many years, you know, I am talking about intractable conflict with last, which lasts at least 25 years. So the whole generation, one generation, uh, leaves uh, the conflict. But Israeli conflict is 100 years, and uh, the Chechen is 300 years, and the Northern Ireland was 500 years. So uh, this is very long period, and uh, and you need to satisfy the needs of the people. So it's very important that the government, uh, the regime that is ruling will uh, uh, really take care of the needs, uh, basic needs of the people. So what are the needs? People have to understand the, uh, and believe in justness of the conflict. You have to believe that uh, that your goals, let's say to take uh, uh, Kashmir or to take West Bank is justified. So the government has to provide a rationale 
to, uh, to the people in order that they will support because people are mobilized to the to fight in the uh, to the uh, for the nation and uh, be ready to die and to kill so they have to believe that the context is uh, the conflict is very right security the government has to provide secure a future to the people. So we see that Israeli government failed and did not provide what, what should provide. The state has to provide security and the government has to lead in sec to secure context. Uh, and there is delegitimization, very important. It's a, a pushing the rival group beyond the human group, category of group, it's a kind of psychological permit to kill. So uh, everyone, you know, uh, Hutu used uh, the label cockroaches for uh, Tutsi. And the cockroaches you kill, murder, obviously as was done in Rwanda. And here in our case, Palestinians are presented uh, collectively as terrorists, as a terrorist entity, and did not distinguish between, uh, between civilians and not civilians. And every act of resistance is uh, considered terror attack, obviously. Even if you write a song or a poem, it's, uh, it's immediately terror, terroristic intention. Uh, which allows to Israeli to look at Palestinians and Palestinians look on Israeli as occupier, occupiers, as colonialists, imperialists, and there is self uh, glorification of self. You know, we say in Israel that Israeli army is the most moral army in the world. Can you imagine, you know? most moral army and everyone, the Russian army is probably uh, perceived by Russian as very moral and the same with uh, Tamils and the same with Sanili in uh, Sri Lanka. <coughs> and then there is a theme of patriotism, which is very important to propagate and to install in the next generation. So patriotism is taught in high school and with the intention that uh, we will uh, rear up fighters uh, who will volunteer to the elite units to be pilots, uh, which is very important, and unity, which is another team. And the last one is somewhat surprising that uh, uh, the ethos talks about peace. We want peace. The peace only can come if the other side will want peace. So this is eight themes related together, provide a kind of narrative to Israelis and Palestinians uh, in which they rear up generations through mass media, educational system, leaders, ceremonies, and uh, uh, at the moment in Israel, our, most of the population is really uh, right. It's about before the war, uh, before uh, the coming uh, to power of the government, 65% uh, of the population were, as we call them, rightists. Leftists, rightists. But it does not apply to the socioeconomic distinction as in Europe, but it uh, uh, refers to uh, attitude towards the conflict. So 65% of the Israelis are hawkish, really. So um, uh, as a follow-up question in terms of this, uh, this conflict ethos and the collective narrative, you, you emphasize uh, the way in which Israelis, specifically uh, Jewish Israelis, are kind of socialized into this 
uh, conflict uh, ethos, this this collective narrative of the conflict that helps them um, to uh, live through the conflict, to explain it, to make sense of it, that justifies their sac sacrifices, etc. I wonder though um, about the change in this in this ethos, in this narrative. In other words, do you see over the generations any changes in it, or do you see it more as being a kind of continuous ethos, a continuous na narrative that hasn't really changed from one generation to the next? Or, or are there in fact changes from one generation to the next in, in their, this ethos, in, ha in the narrative that they have? Do you see change or do you see really a picture of continuity? Okay, it's a very good question. You know, there is a change. I, okay, I have to talk, uh, to divide my answer to, to two. Uh, what was going on uh, from January 2023 today, uh, up to uh, October 7, and what was going on as a process? The process was going on so the next generation was found to be more hawkish and more religious, which means that the ethos was penetrating into the next generation more and more. Only according to the polls, very uh, consistent, only 15% of Israelis between 2000 and uh, 2023 were, were what we call leftist. How did it happen? It happened because the educational system was uh, mostly uh, taken by the uh, rightist people who changed very much uh, the content, uh, in fact, by bringing a young generation to the West Bank on tours. And you have to remember that in 1972, a minister uh, of education at the time, uh, Igal Alon, erased the, the green line. So the maps of Israel since 1972 present the whole area between the sea and the river as one entity. So when you ask a child today, an adolescent even, what is Green Line? They don't know. They view the whole area as a one entity, one unit, which belongs grand, greater Israel. Now, I, I want to say, I divided it into two parts. In the demonstration, so that we're going on about 40 weeks every Saturday, about at least 150,000 people were demonstrating, and sometimes even 300, 400,000 people were demonstrating against the government to try to destroy the democracy the elements of democracy in the, in, in the state of Israel. So slowly, slowly, the slogan that you don't have democracy with occupation penetrated really to the demonstrators and also at the beginning, the mainstream of the demonstrators did not want to, to mess or to uh, talk about uh, occupation, eventually towards the end of the, you know, October, they started more and more to refer to occupation. So people heard talks. You have to imagine, I, I want to tell you what, what was the essence of demonstration. You, I talk 40 weeks, 40 weeks, there were four speeches, four talks. So the public learned what is democracy, what are obstacles to democracy. Can you imagine 40 by uh, 460 lectures? So Israeli uh, public got to know what does it mean democracy 
and understood more and more that occupation is really an obstacle to democracy. But all finished on October 7. At the moment, the, the atmosphere, the climate is revenge. Revenge, revenge, and revenge. We want to get them, we want to kill them. And this is the revenge which really pushes the government to enter to Gaza Street. So I want to I want to turn back a minute to, to uh, move away from the just current events for a moment and uh, get back to some of the big argument here uh, that you present. And uh, I wonder, um, in terms of this conflict ethos and collective narrative, um, do you think there is a distinction between how religious Jewish Israelis versus secular Jewish Israelis? Absolutely, absolutely. Could you, could you say a little bit about how? Whether they, you know, because whether they have a shared ethos or, in fact, whether there is a, quite a different. It's, it's very clear. You see, we, in terms of, uh, you know, a religious sector, uh, and we have we have kind of uh, three sectors. We say religious sector, uh, sector uh, which is called the secular sector, about forty-seven percent and uh, we call traditional sector, which is also divided to two, traditional secular, traditional religious really sector. Within the religious sector, we have two sectors and also it's divided. Uh, so we have ultra religious people, which are divided to three streams, uh, which are Hasidim, as we call it, and then uh, Lithuanians, and then uh, uh, Mizrahi, which are uh, Eastern. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to ask you to uh, keep your answer short because we, we have more questions coming in and we only have 15 minutes, so. I will tell you, so uh, the I think, end story I think you can assume our audience ultra does Orthodox, know, uh, Ultra-Orthodox got settled in West Bank. The third of the population in the, in the West Bank are ultra orthodox in Beitar and other places. They were directed by the government to settle. So they have now invested interest in keeping West Bank. So they moved to the uh, to the rightist uh, uh, really uh, sector, and you have the uh, religious people in total is very, very rightist. Okay, I wanna um, ask you then uh, about um, the attack that Hamas uh, carried out, the terrorist attack um, specifically. Um, and I wonder whether um, the nature of the violence that Hamas committed, specifically uh, the kind of barbaric, you know, really sadistic level of violence that, that uh, um, that they engaged in. Does that, do you think, change the way in which Israelis are viewing this? Absolutely. Uh, the kind of Absolutely. trauma that they're going to experience? Because this isn't just, that we're not just talking about, you know, as if it's bad enough, this mass killing, but mass killing in a, in a particularly group. Massacre, right. Uh, Absolutely. And, and that Israelis are having to see that on their social media feeds, on television. How did that change the reaction among the Israeli public to what's taken place, do you think? So it's, uh, as I said, you know, uh, the stories are circulated by the media, by social media, and the stories are horrendous, you know, with a lot of sadism, uh, where, you know, babies are killed, uh, women are raped, uh, bodies are mutilated, I mean, unbelievable. And they are circulated again and again, on, in certain way on purpose in order to create uh, uh, such a trauma. And uh, Israeli society is at, 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 at present very traumatized and, and the revenge is very human. I mean, I, I look at this and, and see it as a human uh, process that is unavoidable 
when the society experiences uh, this type of atrocities, it is human that you uh, really feel uh, revenge. And especially with the government that really wants to have a kind of victory a picture you know, at the end of the war. And uh, Netanyahu needs it very much. So this interest is in, invested into what is going on, but he didn't need, you know, people, social media is spreading the information. And each day you hear again and again and again the same stories. Uh, what about, um, you know, so so one element of, of the attack was the, I think, this, you know, shocking level of violence. The other that uh, is, I think, stands out was the um, surprising nature of this, that this was not, unlike, you know, Hamas suicide bombings during the Second Intifada, which tragically became almost routine for Israelis. They were expecting it, that it became, they became almost accustomed to uh, the uh, constant suicide bombings that Hamas carried out. In this instance, in this attack, this came really out of the blue in, in the same way that, uh, you know, e Egypt and Syria surprised Israel in, in October of 1973. Um, could you say something about the psychological, specifically the psychological kind of repercussions of a surprise attack? Of, a, of a, something that comes so with such a shock, how does that, do you think, impact the kind of traumatic experience uh, for- In my opinion, very much. If, you know, let's assume in a different scenario, scenarios of, uh, you know, people are prepared uh, in certain way, uh, so something is going to happen, so so the suddenness of uh, the events had a really, uh, I mean, unprecedented uh, really uh, case where people were caught. You know, there was a festival, as you may know, uh, close to this where people from uh, Tel Aviv came and around and they were dancing and singing and it really in the middle of the festival were caught in the fire and the atrocities. Uh, so it is absolutely a factor that it was surprise. On the other hand, you know, uh, we are expecting that uh, uh, the responsible people will admit the responsibility. So at the moment, uh, the security service, the army, all of them asked, uh, you know, some kind of, I would say, forgiveness, so they did not uh, perceive uh, signs. The signs who came at night of uh, October 7, uh, about two hours before the attack, uh, there was a consultation between army and security service or something is going on, but it was too late. The only ones who did not uh, express a regret and responsibility is Netanyahu. Okay, I want us to, uh, we have uh, about 10 minutes left and I, I'd like us to talk a little bit about um, the, the, the possibility of change in the ethos and narrative, uh, because, you know, in your book, you, you know, you emphasize the, the power of this conflict ethos and the collective narrative and the way that successive generations of Israelis are socialized to, uh, it, to, to accept this ethos and this narrative and that, that this ultimately serves to kind of extend and prolong the conflict. Um, now, I think the danger of that uh, analysis, which I don't uh, take issue with, but the danger of it is that it can be kind of deterministic, right? That it can suggest that it's really impossible to escape this ethos. And especially if we take uh, the terrorist attack by Hamas, that seems to have only, you know, um, reinforced that narrative. In fact, if anything, even uh, further by, by underlining the kind of barbaric nature of that attack. Um, 
Can you say something about how now these kind of collective ethos um, or narrative can change and maybe drawing upon the experience of other intractable conflicts that have moved toward resolution like in Northern Ireland. Um, what are the kinds of interventions or, or, or steps that could be made to, um, to move toward changing this narrative um, and this ethos and, and, and promoting uh, um, support for uh, reconciliation and peace? Uh, yeah, it's a very difficult question. You know, changing of ethos means changing societal change. It's, you know, macro level, very, very difficult to do. And it takes years to, but when we look at, the, especially in, on Israel, we had such an experience. You have to know that Egyptian up to 1977 were perceived as the most important enemy uh, in our area. You know, Egyptians were seen as Nazi. Sadat was carried in Purim of 1977 in March, dressed as Gestapo officer. Can you imagine, which is the ultimate enemy for us? And then in 1977, November, he was accepted in Israel in Ben Gurion Airport with a red carpet. And very quickly, there was sign, uh, uh, signed uh, by Carter, obviously uh, mediating. And there was an agreement in 79, I think. Israel had to retreat from peninsula, did it in 81. And Egyptians are viewed for us as uh, really, uh, really allies in some respect. You know, I visited Egypt several times and uh, we go and we are met by people in the market and they, are you, uh, they really refer to us very nicely. So it's an experience that we had. We had also an experience in 1993, where in the same jeep were sitting Palestinian fighters and Israeli soldiers. So it was also. So, but it, it was a different story. It was very much uh, resisted uh, half of the half of Israel. So it is possible. Now, when you look at the war, you know, the goal did it with Algerian war, and we saw it in Spain with Basque, and we saw it also in Northern Ireland. So it's possible, but each of the cases is very different, and it depends on different factors. One is on leader, one on mediators, one of civil society. There is need to work together in order to change really ethos, which is the foundation of the culture of conflict. Is it possible to change the Israeli ethos of conflict and the narrative if the Palestinian ethos of conflict and narrative doesn't change? In other words, you know, is it possible for one side on a in a long running conflict to shift its understanding and its collective narrative about the conflict if the other side doesn't engage in simultaneous, simultaneous change? Because many people would say, what we also see on the Palestinian side uh, and among many of their supporters is uh, this an ethos which sees uh, Jews as essentially uh, colonizers who have no right to be there. And that will event, and they will eventually be forced out or, um, of of the land. So, is it is it possible? Is it how can Israelis change their understanding when they see and hear this um, other narrative, this other conflict ethos on the Palestinian? Absolutely, as I said, it's very difficult. It cannot come within a year. It, it's not the case. Is Egyptian case, which was uh, because of different factors, uh, uh, relatively relatively easy. Here is a 
story which is very complicated because a, a large a sector of Israel believes in greater Israel, uh, which means that in Israel between sea and Jordan River, that it is our God given and our history, creed of history. So it is very difficult in my opinion uh, to carry such a really move of changing narrative. It comes in phases, it come, uh, you know, theoretically, I can explain to you, you know, but what the theory and practice is very different. So I, I say very often that I am good uh, pheromaniac uh, and as a, a really coming to really uh, bring the fire down, I have difficulty uh, in terms of theory and in terms of conception. So um, we only have a couple of minutes left, and I, I feel like uh, it, if it's at all possible to, to um, provide our, our audience members with some shred of hope, maybe some glimmer of possibility, is there anything in all of the horror um, that we've witnessed over the last 12 days and, and the terrible tragedy that uh, Israelis have suffered, is there any anything that we can take from this terrible time to see maybe a glimmer of hope that maybe something out of this, something good may come out of this, some renewed possibility for, um, for peace, or maybe given the fact that both Arab citizens and Jewish citizens of Israel were killed uh, by uh, Hamas terrorists, that maybe it can bring Arabs and Jews within Israel together. Is there anything you can leave us with uh, which maybe uh, people can see some some positive uh, sign for the future. I, I yes, you know, uh, one it depends very much on uh, you, you know you you, you uh, your president. Uh, so so uh, I believe that forces in Europe and forces in the United States, the same forces, uh, should really push Israel in such a way that should put a red, a red line what can be do or what cannot be done. I hope that President Biden today express this red lines to Netanyahu who is ready to go enter Gaza Strip and continue the war as we heard so that it will last months and years you know, and it came probably from a very su superior figure in the government. So say, saying such, such sentence yesterday means that Israel intends really to enter to Gaza without thinking what is next. We need the involvement of Europe, involvement of uh, United States, to put very clear clarification uh, what can be done and push. You know, I know that Joe Biden did not want to be involved in Middle East, but he now is thrown into the conflict and he has to carry it, you know, the way that the uh, American presidents did in the past. Uh, and he has to put really very clear steps uh, in front of the Israeli government in order to stop the vicious cycles of violence. Okay, thank you. Well, not exactly that optimistic, but uh, I am very grateful for you uh, sharing your uh, insights with us, um, particularly uh, given the uh, times that we're living through. And I want to thank you uh, for coming on. I also thank want you. to thank all of our audience members for joining us today. Uh, a reminder, we had a webinar um, last week uh, with myself and Dalia Dasake talking about uh, the uh, terrorist attack and the unfolding war. Um, that is available on our website and YouTube channel if you'd like to watch that. We also held an event uh, last night for uh, 
uh, our campus community. Um, and you can also uh, watch a recording of that, which will also be uh, up on our website and YouTube shortly. And we'll be um, doing more webinars in the uh, weeks uh, to come. So uh, I hope you will uh, join us in the future as well. Um, thank you all and goodbye. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>